This week, after nearly four months of withstanding the might of the Kaiserschlacht, the German spring offensives, week after week after week, the Allied counterattack finally comes. I'm Indy Nidell. Welcome to The Great War. Last week there was a lot of action far to the east in Siberia, but it was primarily a week of planning, as the Germans finalized plans for their next Western Front offensive, even in the face of a deadly flu epidemic. That offensive, which would be known as the Second Battle of the Marne, kicked into gear this week. The Germans were going to attack with Crown Prince Wilhelm's 49 divisions. One of the goals was to open a second railway line to the Marne, and also to draw off Allied reserves from Flanders in the north for an attack up there that would happen in just a few days. The Allies knew exactly when this week's attack was coming though, so French and American artillery bombarded the German front lines and jumping off points half an hour before the German bombardment began. The German barrage was still pretty strong though, for example raining 17,500 rounds of gas on the sector of front held by the American Rainbow Division. Then the Germans went over the top, east of Rheim, and found that the French trenches weren't exactly trenches. Well okay, they were trenches, but they were only lightly manned, and the German bombardment had been wasted on them. The Germans overran these and killed what few defenders there were, but the Real trenches further back were basically untouched and, of course, full of French soldiers. French General Philippe Piton, after pushing so hard for so long for the French to use a defense in depth system to neutralize the German shock troop advantage, had finally gotten his wish and General Henri Gouraud had implemented it. And as the Germans advance on the man trenches, they came under heavy fire from French and American artillery. The Chief of Staff of the Rainbow Division, Douglas MacArthur, said, When they met the dikes of our real line, they were exhausted, uncoordinated and scattered, incapable of going on without being reorganized and reinforced. That was east of Rheim. West of Rheim, where the French under Jean de Goutte and the French and Italians under Henri Berthelot were using the old system with the men too far forward, the Germans were quickly successful, though their failure in the east meant that those successful German troops were dangerously exposed, so they called off the attack in the west. But it had to keep going somewhere, because it was essential to draw Allied reserves away from Flanders before the German attack up there. On the 16th, the German bombardment was renewed, now against the French and Americans in Champagne, including half a million gas shells. Over the next two days, it seemed like the Germans would break through. and That could have been the decisive breakthrough, but in one sector French gunners knocked out all 20 German tanks, and another fewer than 4,000 Americans, outnumbered 3 to 1, held their ground in vicious hand-to-hand -hand fighting, while overhead 225 French bombers with 40 tons of bombs dropped them on the bridges the Germans had set up across the River Marne. Near Chateau Thierry, the American 3rd Division managed to blow up every single pontoon bridge the Germans set up in the whole sector, earning itself the sobriquet, the Rock of the Marne. But the Germans kept on coming, pouring into the river in the face of machine guns and infantry, to the point that by noon that day, as American General Joseph T. Dickman would write, there were no Germans in the foreground of the 3rd Division except the dead. The Americans also took heavy casualties holding back the tide. On the 17th, Italian troops that had been brought in stopped the Germans at Nantoi Porsi. On the morning of the 18th, German Quartermaster General Erich Ludendorff had a conference with his command where the first thing he did was dismiss any possibility of an Allied counterattack in the south. Then they talked about tactical options if the British in Flanders used the same new defense system the French just had. And then around noon came the word that Allied Supreme Commander Ferdinand Foch had in fact launched an Allied counterattack. It kicked off with a 2,000 gun artillery barrage along just over a 40 kilometer front. French General Charles Mangin led 23 divisions, four of them American, following nearly 500 tanks in an attack to try and recapture Soissons and seal off the German salient. David Stevenson writes in With Our Backs to the Wall, not for the last time, the Germans were wholly surprised. 
Part of the reason was overconfidence. Crown Prince Wilhelm had thought the Allies too weak both to defend Rheims and to counterattack. But the Allies had agreed that surprise was absolutely crucial for success, so concentrating the forces leading up to the attack was done in just four days. Well, nights, since it was all done in darkness, and the tanks were hidden in the forest. This counterattack was huge, on a total front of over 100 kilometers by four armies. But the spearhead was the 1st and 2nd American divisions and the 1st Moroccan division, who were largely Senegalese. The bulk of the tanks were light Renaults, armed with machine guns that could go like 13 or 14 kilometers per hour, and they attacked out of the mist. The German lines broke and they were driven back some seven kilometers. 20,000 Germans were taken prisoner, as well as 400 big guns. As the week came to an end though, Mangin was stopped before he could reach Soissons. And there were some seriously heavy Allied casualties. For example, the Italian Corps fighting on the 19th lost a third of its strength. But after just the first two days, now the Germans might have no realistic hope left of taking Rennes, and the German threat to Paris would then be no more. But more importantly, if the Marne salient became unholdable, Ludendorff would have no real choice but to postpone the Flanders offensive indefinitely. There is a story from this week, maybe true, maybe not, of a ruse devised by a couple of American engineers. A briefcase with fake plans for the counterattack was handcuffed to a man who had died of pneumonia, right? Then they put him in a vehicle that looked like it had run off the road at a German-controlled bridge. The Germans found the plans and believed them, then adjusted their own plans to stop the fake Allied plan. So when the Allied attack came, it came elsewhere and hit an exposed part of the German lines, leaving them no choice but to retreat. Again, I don't know if this is true or not. Something that is true from that front is that on the 16th, a German flying ace named Hermann Goering shot down his 22nd plane and three days previously had taken command of the Richthofen squadron. That squadron was named after Baron von Richthofen, the Red Baron, who'd been killed in April. There was Central Powers action on other fronts this week as well. On July 13th, using mainly German troops, General Lehmann von Sanders attacked British General Edmund Allenby's bridgehead on the east bank of the Jordan River, northeast of Jericho. But Australian troops pushed back the attackers. This attack worried the British commando, who thought that if Sanders made such an attack on the Arab Revolt forces east of the river and won, the British flanks would be exposed and their plans for an autumn offensive ruined. One Central Powers offensive had hit some snags though. Nuri Pasha's Army of Islam was advancing at a crawl through the Caucasus towards Baku. The summer heat, the lack of sufficient drinking water, and poor supply lines would have slowed any army, but his was now racked by an epidemic of dysentery. By the time his forces reached Kurdamir, he estimated he had only 4,000 soldiers that were really fit for active fighting. Add to that that the Azeri militia were deserting in droves, so he had only around 8,000 men at the moment available to try and take Baku and its oil fields, but he would try at the end of the month. As for those defending the city, on the 15th, after skirmishing west of it and nearly being encircled, Colonel Bisharikov comes to the conclusion that his Cossacks, even bolstered by the Armenians and the Red Guard, cannot stop the Ottomans with their artillery in the open field. They retreated towards the city's environs to plan the defense there. And here are two notes to end the week. On July 16, 1918, Tsar Nicholas Romanov and his family were executed at Ekaterinburg, capital of Red Ural, by order of the Ural Regional Soviet. Deposed by the February Revolution last year, Nicholas had been the force that guided Russia into this war four years ago. There was also news this week from another initial guiding force of the war. On July 15th, after the huge failure of the recent Austrian offensive in Italy, Franz Konrad von Hotzendorf is dismissed and placed on the retired list. He is also raised from Freiherr to Graf, so from like Baron to like Count. But for Konrad von Hotzendorf, this war is over. And this week of the war ends with yet another German offensive, but a mighty Allied counterattack that, as the week ends, is a success. A German failure in the Middle East, setbacks in the Caucasus, and the death of a Tsar. Well, he was no longer the Tsar. You know, when you think about it, 
there's nearly no one left. The leaders, the men who guided the world into this war or led the armies or both three years and 50 weeks ago, they're almost all gone. Call the roll, Nicholas, Conrad, Franz Joseph, Moltke, Joffre, French, Putnik, they're all gone. Only Enver Pasha and Kaiser Wilhelm remain at their posts from those 1914 days, and even the Kaiser's power has been reduced by army command. It's now different men fighting with different weapons and different tactics, and it's also a totally, totally different world. If you'd like to learn more about the Allied tactics in response to the German spring offensives of 1918, you can click right here for our special episode about that. Our Patreon supporter of the week is Kolja Hartmann. Thank you for your support on Patreon. Please support us on Patreon if you can. Even one dollar really counts and allows us to make this show better and better. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.